As we know from the grand engineering challenges, there's, there's no shortage of problems uh, that need to be solved. So we're going to shift gears uh, from student innovation to another rather significant problem that's hit us, particularly here in the United States, uh, pretty hard, and that's storms. So for more than 20 years, Tim Samaras has been chasing tornadoes in efforts to get the elusive data that will allow us to better understand these dangerous phenomena. He is featured on the Discovery Channel's uh, show Storm Chasers and has also worked extensively with National Geographic and university researcher, researchers in order to pioneer new methods for gathering data in dangerous environments. Tim arguably has the most advanced tornado logging system on the earth, powered by LabVIEW, of course. And today, Tim is going to share the data he has gathered and the great links he had to go to get it. Please welcome from the Discovery Channel Storm Chasers, Tim Samaras. Good morning. I have to tell you, it is a real pleasure to be here. Why? Because I think I fit right in. <laughs> this and all the technology that you've seen this morning and what's out there and what I've seen powered by LabVIEW was incredible. I wished when I was younger, like 13 or 14, when I was in my bedroom doing all kinds of scientific experiments, I wished I had these tools, because you never know what would happen. This morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my passion, storms. But before I get into those details, I want to ask one question of the crowd. How many of you go out to the window when you hear a thunderstorm or a clap of thunder or the rain? A show of hands, please. Oh, yeah. Me too. Except I take it just a little bit further. <laughs> I go out and I chase the biggest, baddest storms on the planet. Supercell thunderstorms and tornadoes represent the most powerful winds on the planet. And of course, the challenge here is to go out and measure that monster. That's, that's a Pretty good challenge. And so today, I'm going to share with you some of my techniques, some of the tools, and some of the incredible experiences that I've had over the past 20 years. 2011 is no exception for tornadoes this year. Everybody knows the devastation they brought the past spring one of which included the super outbreak of April 25th through 28th of 2011. What you see here is a satellite running for three days showing the onset of storms that ravaged the Dixie Alley. First, the first day, it actually started off in Texas for producing multiple tornadoes. Second day, the storms initiated across Mississippi and Alabama, creating a devastating count of 336 tornadoes total. 146 people killed. Later that spring, Joplin, Missouri, May 22nd, 2011. Single most killer tornado killing almost 158 people. One tornado. Why? These are the, some of the answers, some of the things that I try to seek out, try to understand, and how I do that is by trying to understand the thunderstorm and tornado process. So being that storms and chasing and tornadoes is a bit of my passion, guess what? I get to mix some of my work and passion now. And I have to tell you, for those students that are out there, keep your, keep your focus on the passion in life, the things that you enjoy doing. You'll get there. Trust me. I'm doing it. Tuscaloosa damage. This is just on the outskirts of Tuscaloosa. Several violent tornadoes went through this area. Believe it or not, in Alabama alone, there were over 1,000 miles of tornado tracks in that one state 
in one day. One of these tornadoes that went through Tuscaloosa was on the ground for over 150 miles. I watched this tornado personally. I was there. I watched that tornado as it formed southwest of Tuscaloosa. Fortunately, we had cell phone service. We called it in and provided emergency management some warning, heads up, the tornado was coming. So how do we do this? How do we go out and try to collect measurements from those powerful storms on Earth? Well, what we try to do is assemble together some of the brightest scientists, engineers, passionate storm observers, and bring them together and focus ourselves on one mission. We called this mission TWISTX, Tactical Weather Sampling and Tornadoes Thunderstorms Experiment. What we try to do is to collect data outside the thunderstorm and inside the tornado. We work with students from Iowa State University. We challenge these students to forecast tornadoes. I don't know if you guys try to forecast tornadoes before. It's hard. <laughs> it's very difficult. The brightest minds in the world can't tell you which thunderstorm is going to produce a tornado, and, that was, and others don't. We're still trying to figure this out. And for the, stu the aspiring students in the crowd here who think the scientists out here have all the answers, you're wrong. We need your help to help solve these things. It's not going to be solved in a year's time. It'll be solved probably in 10 to 20 years by research that we're currently doing. What we try to do, of course, is collect measurements on the inside of the tornado. 10 years ago, I developed a set of instruments to do just that. These are uh, uh, hardened probes that are 20 inches in diameter, 6 inches high, and uh, they measure very accurately the static pressure as the tornado goes over. Why measure the static pressure? The static pressure provides an idea how powerful that tornado is. The lower the pressure, the stronger the tornado. Mother Nature does not like to be off balance. If there's a 100 millibar pressure differential in the center of a point, you're going to get a lot of wind trying to equilibrate that. So our, our task in the past 10 years is actually deploy these instruments, collect the barometric pressure through a calculation we can understand and, and roughly guess what the uh, wind speeds are. The center instrument there actually has video cameras in it. What we're trying to do is to provide visualization uh, of the tornado as it goes over the top so we can understand some of the wind structure as the tornado passes over. And yes, although these were built in 1999, we had LabVIEW to help calibrate these things and download the data, of course. The instrument that now runs, currently runs a uh, compact DAC, all powered by LabVIEW, is this big monster. This instrument is actually in display on the back of my truck, sitting in the exhibition room. Uh, it weighs 500 pounds. How fast do you think I can get this off the truck? <laughs> well, last year, we had uh, an earlier prototype of this instrument. We deployed it in the path of a strong tornado. You'll see some of the video, although our guys were too busy deploying the instrument as opposed to taking video. But we clocked ourselves to 29 seconds getting it off the truck. Now, when we actually deployed the instrument in the path of a tornado, amazingly enough, that time dropped to 20 seconds. <laughs> it's amazing what a tornado coming right at you does for, motiva for motivation. <laughs> Works every time. So, you know, obviously we've got a very powerful computer system, uh, industrial computer, solid state hard drive, everything gets streamed on there. One of the things that's not measured in here, we're actually recording acoustic data. We've got four channels of microphones. The top end of the microphone is 179 dB, in case it's really loud in there. Um, it's, uh, it's accomplished by one of the NI's DAC systems. The really cool thing is it's four channels, 100 kilo samples per second, 24-bit A to D, and it streams forever until the hard drive fill. That's unheard of. I couldn't do that before. Now I can. I turn that thing on, it fills the hard drop, drive up in about four hours. Boy, I hope a tornado hits it by then. <laughs> and uh, one of the instruments that, uh, we've, uh, uh, that I've come up with is the, um, what we call the MPSA instrument. That instrument also measures uh, wind speed and direction up to 300 miles per hour. Of course, to reduce all this data and to display it in 
in real time as a moving timeline with all the data in sync. Of course I use DIDEM. And the software allows me to quickly move the engineering units. It's funny how the scientific community goes. They want to see the data in meters per second, the wind. If I present some of the data to the viewing public, they want it miles per hour. Sometimes I like the data in cows per minute. <laughs> this is the new instrument I spoke of. This is the MPSA, the Modified Pedostatic Anemometer. It's old technology to be brought into a new type of measurement. Obviously, the pedostatic tube has been used for a long, long time measuring aircraft speed. Why can't it measure a tornado? So we've taken it, modified it, put an embedded processor in it, and uh, obviously I've got it um, uh, saying 300 miles per hour, but as we all know, pedostatic tubes can go even higher than that, even approaching sonic. Maybe a little different uh, calculation there, but it can do it. It's modified, call it modified, because the way we're measuring the static pressure allows us to decide whether or not that instrument's pointed into the wind or not. If it's not pointed in the wind, we throw the data out. Because as you know, this, as you can see, this rocket thing on a stick is actually, it can move azimuth in elevation so that it can adjust to a 3D wind profile. The other thing that scares all of the local township is this instrument on top of our cars. This instrument is uh, what we call a mobile mesonet system. It measures wind speed, direction, barometric pressure, temperature, and humidity as we drive down the road. We used uh, mathematics, powered by LabVIEW, to understand and subtract out our vehicle motion and direction. So what we read is the actual wind speed. So we can fly down the interstate at um, the speed limit, of course. And I can tell you that the winds are out of the east at 10 knots. And then, of course, we data log this data to our, our, not only our laptops, but we upload it to our server in real time. Another thing that we've carried along with us uh, that uh, company EWR has graciously led us to have is um, Doppler radar. Doppler radar provides us the wind velocities of tornadoes so we can measure the wind of these tornadoes at 100, 200 meters up in the air while collecting some of the values near the ground. For the last 15 years, scientists have been collecting mobile Doppler radar uh, of tornadoes. They got terabytes of data on the wind structure. They hardly have any measurements near the ground, so they can't understand how powerful that tornado is near the surface of the ground. They could tell you, they, you, they, they could tell you all day long how powerful that tornado was several meters, several hundred meters in the air, but to have a link of that measurement and near the ground is what's needed. Of course, sometimes it's hard to coordinate a, a Doppler radar that's owned by a university along with us, so we decided to carry our own. Everybody should have one. <laughs> we have four vehicles in our fleet. Uh, the truck is, uh, the big black truck in the corner there is no longer. I'll show you what the, uh, the new truck looks like. But we drive three other vehicles, mobile mesonets, we call them. Uh, we have, uh, of course, the first one is the uh, uh, participation by Iowa State University. The other two are resident scientists and other volunteers. Basically, these three vehicles we take and we surround the thunderstorm with these vehicles as the tornado may be in progress or may not be in progress. The goal is for us to understand some of the air that these thunderstorms are ingesting. And then at the same time, hopefully, with a little bit of luck, we make the measurement of the tornado core itself. For those of you who think that tornado is photoshopped back there, you're wrong. We were actually waiting for deployment because this this quarter of a mile wide tornado was currently over a lake. Unless I had a big boat, there was no deployments. Certainly our core mission is to collect data from tornadoes and tornado environments, better understand tornado genesis, decay, and dynamics. And one of the things that is coming uh, front and center with a lot of the research we've done is boundaries associated with supercells. What, what is a boundary? Basically, a boundary is a line along the surface. It could win, uh, represent a wind shift, 
It could be a difference in wind, it could be a temperature change, it could be a, a humidity change. Basically, a boundary seems to enhance tornadoes or seems to enhance supercells and actually creates a better environment for tornadoes. So it's our ability to identify and locate some of these boundaries and whether or not a thunderstorm is actually going to form on it and then move across. Now I love diagrams, I love to show data. This is one day that we had in South Dakota. How many of you out there heard of the city Menno, South Dakota? Yeah, just about nobody. Oh, there's a few over there. Very good. Probably from South Dakota, right? I have to tell you, that's my favorite state in the world to go chase. Beautiful, beautiful country out there. Anyway, what you're looking at here is uh, radar data. It's velocity data. And the colors that you see there, the green means that the wind and precipitation is flowing towards the radar. The red means the, the wind and the precipitation flowing away where you see the tight gradient couplet is the tornado, or the developing tornado in this case. What you see, those, those three or four green circles there, is our vehicles. Now, for those who are not familiar with the meteorological symbols up there, the, the flag up there, the, the full flag and the half flag up on the stem, the full flag means 10 knots, half flag means five knots. And, the, and where that's setting means that that wind from P, probe, that's me, uh, winds at 15 knots out of the northeast. The other vehicles are experiencing similar conditions except M2 is out of the southwest. Now I'm gonna play this, and, and this is actually accelerated, but it kind of shows you what we're trying to do to collect measurements with this developing tornado. You can see the little red circle up there, that's a depiction uh, by Chris Karstens of where the, met the, the rotation is because um, unfortunately the radar only gets updated every 10 or, 10 or 12 minutes, which is kind of painful. But nevertheless, what happens here now, P, I'm radioing to these guys here, M3, M2, M1, that there's a tornado in progress. These three guys here can't see the tornado. Why? Because it's rain wrapped. So I'm, ray I'm saying, hey guys, keep driving south, get out of the way, it's headed for you. Well, fortunately, you can see the intensification. M1 and M2 listened. They're heading straight south. I think they're driving to Kansas. But M3, Tony, decides to make a right. There he goes. And we're trying to deploy now. Guess what? The, the developing tornado is between us. And Tony is about to get eaten. You can see the intensification, but here the winds actually broadened out a little bit. So fortunately, the, the tornado kind of broadened out, and now it's, so it's more like a land hurricane. But nevertheless, we had collected an astounding data set just simply from a mobile mesonet by a rain-wrapped tornado. Storm chasers call a rain-wrapped tornado something, they call it, a, the storm chasers call a rain-wrapped tornado the bear's cage. Bear's cage means if you cross the cage of rain, the tornado's inside. It's a place that new storm chasers don't want to be, but of course, we're in the bear's cage all the time, unfortunately. I want to talk a little bit about a data set that we collected from this tornado. May 22nd, 2010, we had a very powerful tornado near Bowdle, South Dakota, which is about 30 miles west of Aberdeen. This tornado was responsible for pulling high voltage lines out of the ground, balling them up, and tossing them 600 feet. They only rated it EF4, but we've seen clear evidence where this tornado should have been rated EF5. This is the path of the tornado. It, 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 it formed in the south, uh, southwest of town. Fortunately for the tiny community of Bowdle, it went to the north and west. You can see right in the center there, that's where we deployed our instrument uh, as it was uh, strengthening up the EF2. This is one of the very rare data sets we've collected as the tornado began to intensify, and we collected data as it intensified. Then later on, it, it uh, hit peak intensity over several farmsteads. It tossed an SUV over 100 feet. 
very, very destructive tornado. Some of the data that we collected from our sonic anemometer. One of the things that's kind of a pet peeve of mine, I know it's a pet peeve of yours, is truth and data. When you collect some data from your instrument, you know, you have the tendency to filter it out, filter the noise out, and as we know, sometimes the noise filtering and depending on what you do with that data kind of alter your results. So I believe in a truth in, in, in disclosing everything. What you, the graph on the top represents the, the, the wind speed out of our sonic anemometer. The railing, the, 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 the VCC and ground railing noise, basically that was um, debris flowing through the anemometer. So what we did, of course, is just filter that out and uh, have just represented the true wind speed. Now, what I, what I failed to tell you was that we are making measurements at three different heights, 0.7, 1.2, two meters. What we're trying to understand is how fast the acceleration, the wind acceleration, comes from the ground up. In order to do that, we make three separate measurements at those heights. And in this case, what I, of course, what I'm trying to find out is where's the greatest acceleration rate of the wind? Come to find out, the gra two graphs on the right, the two meter wind speed and 0.75 meter wind speed, you put them together, they're the same. In this case, what that tells me is that the greatest rate of change in wind is in the first two feet of the tornado. Pretty astounding. It kind of took the attention of some of the scientists who, who thought they had it all figured out until we presented them some real world data. I love doing that. All right, for those of you who thought I was gonna come up here and talk about tornadoes the entire time, I'm sorry to disappoint. I love lightning. Probably not the way you guys love lightning, because it strikes your instruments and wrecks havoc with everything. But that was something that I wanted to look at and study. I said, well, Tim, uh, how are you going to do that? Get your buddy out there to hold a golf club? No. Of course, remote observation is what we're going to do. But first, a quick primer. I know most of you have probably seen this cartoon in your science textbooks back in school, but just a quick primer. Static charge build up from the cloud descends down. This is what they call the step leader. It actually reaches down. The second pane is the dart leader. They connect on the third pane, and then boom, the flash you see and the bang you hear from lightning is caused by the return stroke on that fourth panel. The delta time between panes one through three is on the order of about seven to 10 milliseconds. The delta time for the um, for the uh, uh, return stroke on the fourth panel from ground to cloud happens about four microseconds. Pretty darn fast. Of course, what I wanted to do is to provide some visualization to that process. Because every time I open up a textbook, all I see is cartoons. Why do they have cartoons? Because they don't have any imagery. So. Tim has tasked himself with some imagery, trying to provide some imagery. You know, I guess my career has gone, gone along where I have a lot of people telling me no. You can't do that. You can't measure that. Are you nuts? I had a very prominent scientist told me once when I was presenting some of my uh, earlier data. I says, Tim, forget about trying to measure a tornado. You can't do it. We tried it for 10 years and gave up. Can't do it. You're wasting your time. Do you think I listen to them? That's exactly why I'm standing here. And some of the first ever data we've ever collected in tornadoes was made by these instruments you've seen on the screen. So moving on, now lightning is the challenge. Of course, I get the same feedback. Oh, Tim, you're wasting your time. But the real trick here is, is applying the right tool for the right job. What we're trying to do now is to collect high-speed imagery of a lightning strike. You know, traditionally, high-speed photography meant film. 16 millimeter film, 400-foot uh, magazine, 10,000 10, frames per second, zip! It's out of the camera in about three seconds. Trick is, when do you turn on the camera? 
That's why there was no imagery. Digital cameras, high-speed digital cameras, now make that possible. 2006, it's just a matter of taking that new technology and applying it to a new problem, or an old problem, sorry. This camera here runs on 28 volts, weighs 15 pounds, and what we're trying to do is capture a naturally produced lightning strike, including the step leader process. Another tool that's a favorite of mine, the kahuna. This camera is uh, kind of a pet project of mine. Uh, this is an old Cold War relic. This camera is capable of 1.5 million frames per second. It ran on film. It's not good enough for me. I converted it to all digital using uh, some Kodak imagers, 11 megapixel, 82 of them replaced onto the film plane. The idea is so that we can capture the lightning strike in good fidelity and good resolution. The A to D converter is 16 bit. Uh, the well size on each of the CCD pixels is 64,000 electrons. It's a good fit. And of course, this camera weighs 1,600 pounds. People say, you're, you're nuts taking that camera out. How are you going to capture a lightning strike? This thing weighs so much. Well, simple. We just put it in a trailer hook it up to my geek mobile, and away we go. Got an onboard generator. So basically, I take the lightning laboratory out to the field. It's mobile, portable. I drive to the thunderstorm. There's a lot of thunderstorm and lightning research laboratories who sit up on a mountain, who park themselves in a field, waiting for these thunderstorms to come. I'm impatient. I'll go to the thunderstorm. So this is a, an example of what you see in a lightning strike, you use a standard video camera. Video camera runs at 30 frames per second. There's not enough time resolved there to really see what's going on here. In fact, the entire strike process can happen between two frames. Even if you take the video frame right here and slow it down, you still can't see the resolution that you want, like right here. It's a pretty picture, but it just doesn't show me what I want to see. And I uh, apologize to the camera guys, I'm walking all over the place. So to do the job right, you have to have the right tool. And this is the right tool to see the step leader process. This camera is running at, thank you. Thank you. This camera's running at 10,000 frames per second. Digital is great. We're all from the A to D world. You know how that A to D works. Rotating memory, you send it a trigger. Basically, that's a stop command. The stop command basically allows you to say pre-trigger and post-trigger. Fantastic stuff. It just keeps going. I, I just put a couple of minutes in there because I just absolutely love to watch it. So now, we could take this imagery, and working with the National Geographic Society, we can now take this imagery and now put it in school textbooks where the students can see the real thing, not just cartoons. So they're great pictures. I agree. They're fantastic. But they also have usefulness in science. Of course, uh, uh, to, add, to collect velocity, we know, the, uh, we know the time resolved between frames. We know some scale of distance. Therefore, we can actually look and measure the velocity of the step leader reaching down. In this case, 138 kilom kilometers per second, ag aggregate over maybe you know, 10 frames. Or you can go frame by frame, see if it's accelerating or decelerating. In very, very rare cases, we can capture the return stroke just at the close of the last frame right on the bottom, and this was the case. And of course, my exposures for the step leader, not for the return stroke. There's two orders of magnitude brightness difference. And National Geographic photographer Karsten Peter, for some reason, had to get in the shot. <laughs> and then afterwards, the, the, after a couple um, uh, millisecond or so, the strike cools. And, uh, and all, but still, even though you don't see it anymore, it still leaves a conductive path. That's why sometimes in the thunderstorm, for all those people who look out windows watching the th lightning, 
That's why you see multiple strikes, because that path, that very particular path, has a more conductive uh, pathway. This is a final shot. This is a black and white camera on 15,000 frames per second. It has three axis sensitivity. So, now my time is running thin. How many of you want to go for a ride? 